to my immediate right is Mike Songson. Um, and Mike is a poet, third generation Southern California. He was telling me before that you grew up in Long Beach? I was born in Long Beach, but Cerritos. Cerritos, okay, went to school in Cerritos. Um, he's been featured on KCT, uh, LA Taco, um, uh, LA Ist, uh, he's part of the Academy of American Poets, um, been featured on shows uh, you know, for KCRW, KBCC, Spectrum, all the local, all the local media outlets. Um, Mike, uh, you know, we and I were just kind of getting to know each other a little bit out there, and, and he has a real feel for for this place because he's lived here his entire life. Uh, to his right is Marissa, Marissa Yuritia. Yuritia, sorry, Marissa Yuritia Gedney. Um, uh, so Marissa is a cultivator. Let's see, courageous cultivator out to witness people. That was the quotes from the bio. Um, she works, uh, she facilitates healing, justice, and growth through transformative leaderships with organizations and people, and co founded uh, Your Truth at Work, a BIPOC leading space for women and gender expressive advocates who demand and desire equity and justice at work. Um, so, not just a creator, but also somebody who's actively working on the work to get people to, to get equality and inclusion. I think that's awesome. Um, you were invited by the former U.S. Poet Laureate, uh, Juan Guerrero, to read at the Los Angeles Library Series aloud. Um, all kinds of all kinds of awesome things here, like uh, studied post-grad in Vermont, the Vermont College of Fine Arts, was a part of the voice of, the, of our nation, um, and her first poetry collection, Altar of the Imagination, is now available. And I believe we have it in our collection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And to her right is Jonathan Pacheco Bell. Um, Jonathan is an uh, urban planner and adjunct professor at Cal Poly Pomona. So, authors, you're an author too, but also urban planner. And I think this is really uh, interesting. So, uh, Jonathan was born in Boyle Heights, raised in East LA, in Montebello. And, you know, very interesting. You know, focusing on Southeast and South Central Los Angeles and looking at how urban planning needs to be part of the community. It can't be something that City Hall kind of imposes on us or there's a bunch of charrettes from a bunch of, you know, outside, you know, usually probably people from outside LA who are like, oh, I think this is how you put a city together. Um, <laughs> how you could do that without asking the people who live there is amazing to me. So Jonathan, thank you for doing that work. It's, it's really amazing. Um, so yeah. Did I miss any big parts? Okay, good. All right, so let's just, like I said, set the table. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna ask you to go first and uh, give us a little bit of your of your poetry. Hey, anybody out there ever been to Middle Earth Records? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. My other place of birth was Middle Earth. All men have secrets and here is mine, so let it be known. Sometime around 1989, I started going to Middle Earth Records in Downey. It was damn near the only place between Long Beach and Melrose that you could get rare music on import. Usually I was sitting shotgun in Philip Kwan's 1983 Mazda RX-7. Kwan wasn't even 16 yet, but his older brother Young let him take the car. We went all over LA County with the windows down and the music loud. Stop me if you think that you've heard this one before. Middle Earth was where we bought cassette tapes of Depeche Mode, The Smiths, The Cure, New Order, Susie and the Banshees, Echo and the Bunnymen, Early U2. I even got the Bowie compilation changes. My other best friend, Philip Medina, was usually with us, too. Medina loved the police, UB40, Screedy Politi, Trash Can Sinatra's Howard Jones, and we all loved Morrissey. The three of us rolled to Middle Earth from our neighborhood in Cerritos, sometimes on the 605 North, sometimes on Lakewood Boulevard, down the long thoroughfare past the Londra, Rosecrans, Imperial, Firestone. K-Rock was our sonic bible. Richard Blade played our soundtrack. Middle Earth, the center of our map where we went to fill up. New Way was modern rock post-punk. Burn down the disco, hang the blessed DJ, because the music that they constantly play says nothing to me about my life. I got the Stone Roses Fool's Gold on imported Middle Earth in 1990. They made me want to go to Manchester, and Morrissey taught me about British poetry. Keats and Yeats are on your side, Wilde is on mine. Middle Earth held the Holy Grail. All of the answers were there. Within a few years, we started to go into Aaron's Records in Hollywood or other far off stores, but Middle Earth was my place of birth where it all started. Our oasis in the suburban wasteland. It was dark as I drove the point home. 
By the time I got to UCLA in 1992, those years of close listening taught me to break down language. I've seen this happen in other people's lives, but now it's happening in mine. Lyrics were my liturgy, whether it was Morrissey telling me the queen is dead. Anybody been listening to that lately? <laughs> I revisited that, the queen is dead. Um, <laughs> or the diggable planet schooling me on the black arts movement. Or early 90s hip hop hitting me to Roy Ayers, P-Funk, and Donald Byrd. The more I heard, the more I learned, the more I explored. There's a light and it never goes out. I dug as deep as I could. And though I was born in Long Beach, my other place of birth was Middle Earth. Nuclear over the 710 apocalypse bright. This corn is claiming colors of what the hills get painted when the sun goes down. Nothing to be scared of in the subtlety of glowing to say goodnight. Corn for tortillas, simple cheap food for the kids to spread butter and sprinkle salt on. But she was stubborn even when there was no point to be made anymore. When alcohol was no longer the problem, it was for her the fear of it coming back. She packed her mitate away, gave up her muscles, turned to sourdough bread instead, San Francisco in a plastic bag. Never looked back to those lunch-making days. If she couldn't work, she put her work into lunches and dinners, nourishing to thick thin. After so many nights of fresh, warm, pressed, ham, pride, hate. She found out he sold them at work for money to buy food. She could have hit him with the gomal, wished one of them dead at least. So never, ever again turn tortilla into tortilla, not in her tongue, the one nuns and her mother thought was stupid, so they beat her. She dropped out like a disease. <clears throat> the one she grew from seeping into her, the one she grew from stress seeping into her joint. No pancakes either, nothing round or soft. She wished for a machine. <clears throat> make waffles. I just remember Jessica was here. <laughs> she knows my mama. She knows me. <laughs> she wished for a machine to make waffles or bread dipped in eggs and cinnamon. New requests so people would stop asking her for that old one. Those colors of corn grown so close to the ocean, that purple, that pink, the color she asked us to wear to her funeral. So beautiful, maybe it would have been time to make her first tortilla. And then I'm going to read one more. I'm going to read what more kind of that goes into the story of her death, or kind of what led to it. What happens when a bird eats lead? You showed me a bird. If color is communication, I see nothing. How can I know in an instant it means love and hope? I can't see the melanin of its intricate iridescence or know why you sent a message via wings. Is it busy grooming off radiation? White doves hang on Whittier Boulevard, a one-day line for Lolita's tamales. What should I do with these birds? Watercolor fluorescent wings? Okay. Bands with gallo feathers? Sure. Put them away in poster mail canisters to keep them safe from moths? Yes. Not take offense when the one on Santa from San Jose says my feathers are going in the wrong direction? A ceramic white swallow sits in front of me for years. What should I do with these birds? I wish I could give you the hummingbirds too, with the crown mohawk of orange spiking to bite the moon of paradise. Winter blooms for such a tropical heat of a plant. In front of the live oak house, protecting phobias, focus on the pain of a constricting throat and tight chest. I leaned on the spiral iron of the porch to breathe what you couldn't. Lead from the leaking battery plant. Pig carcass smoke from Farmer John. What is it like to live inside dead animals, freezing bodies for food? To thread bobbins, exhaust from inefficient machines. Is that what makes a woman die at 73? Her husband died less than a month after her. The birds ate from the same poison. 15, year la 15 years later, they test the dirt for the first time. 
You have to bring your soil to them. Greed doesn't need proof. Teenagers with several small dead siblings, children with leukemia know, mothers who live in hospitals, never talk about their dead children or leave Boyle Heights. This many cases of early cancer cannot be normal. Only death from guns make the headlines. This killer leads an easy massacre. All four sisters get cancer. Skeleton Miha crown of feathers, they say, pheasant. But now each one merged with my thick human hair. I wear my glory high next to a portrait of an artist against her home, blackbird pinned to the wall. Birds that don't fly anymore have other powers to see far away near ones. Call them through a bache. The jumps are high, squats that crack knees. A life breathes. If you felt light as joyfully as the dark, you contain all of the earth. Salt and air fly in you, and that's what sets you free. So do knowing mutators. What is the first to go in a bird's wing? Does it start to lose its feathers from the inside? Can it die as it's flying over the water, gliding? These are the opening words to a manifesto I wrote called, We Cannot Plan From Our Desks. Planning is a desk-bound profession. Our work is performed in an office, detached from the populace, with only occasional field outings and community meetings. Our practice lacks street knowledge. We write long-range plans for neighborhoods we don't frequent. We craft policy without grasping its effect on everyday lives. We enact zoning laws without understanding the mechanisms and consequences of implementation. Put bluntly, we plan for communities that we don't know. For planning to achieve equity in communities, planners need to see the realities of community life. It's time for a radical reorientation in practice. Good planning starts on the ground. We need to get out from behind the comfort of our desks. We need to embed ourselves in the communities we plan. We need to connect with the people we serve. There is a better way. I call it embedded planning. Thank you very much, um, all of you. Um, you know, uh, I love this panel because it's a it's a diverse panel in the sense that you each have different things that are coming to what's what we're going to go on here. And um, and I guess one sort of orienting question to start off. Um, and by the way, do you guys want to make any comments after what you said or anything like that? Or you want to react to each other's work instead of just clapping? <laughs> It was great to hear Marissa just because she makes uh, those the imagery just takes you really in and um, and you know the more personal writer gets also makes it the more universal because we all have those people that we're so close to and um, so thank you and uh, and I've used Jonathan's essay in my class because uh, my whole thing is I'm trying to get young people off the laptop off the iPhone and out into the city and writing about their own personal geography but also writing about their grandmother, and writing about their aunt and their uncle, and, and how Marissa spoke of so uh, These are two great folks right here. Now I want to learn about embedded planning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we will. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I, I consider Mike and Marissa community voices. They're community members, and as an urban planner, this inspires me. And this is why we need to get out of our desk and get close and learn people's stories. Well, then let's let's start in this conversation then with kind of thinking about place. So, um, so uh, you grew up in Cerritos, which is really close. Marissa, where? Huntington Park and then down. Okay. Oh, in down. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? I call Montebello my hometown. Okay. So how do you feel, so basically Southeast LA. So how do you feel like, I mean, I know that directly some of the work that you just shared with both of you really focuses on Southeast LA, or at least has deep roots there. But but really, this question is for everyone. How do you feel like your experiences growing up down here, you know, inform your work, inform how you live, what you want to express to the world? Um, I mean, we can, whoever wants to jump in, I, don't, I have no order here. So you want to go first? Sure. I, I was thinking about this, the answer to this question a lot in relationship to the library actually because 
I mean, this is where I came for to write essays, to probably study for any test. You know, this is where where I was every summer. Uh, you remember the gray carpet? Yeah, yeah. It hadn't oh, changed yeah. for four years, but it, look it, we're making progress. A completely new library, yeah. And but it made me remember, like I didn't feel like I belonged here, and I realized as part of my identity, so I'm third generation Mexican. My parents and my grandparents grew up in different parts of East LA, Boyle Heights. And then the only reason why I think we came to the Southeast LA area at first was my dad's grandparents were able to buy a house in Huntington Park because of they thought that they were Italian because of their last name. Um, and then that's when we moved there and then we moved to Downey, that typical um, transition. Um, I don't think that my parents thought us of Beverly Hills, but I know that they, of East LA, but I know that they thought of it as definitely a, you know, they were becoming middle class. They, this was the place to be. Um, and so even though I have all these privileged identities, third generation, not growing up speaking Spanish necessarily, I don't have a accent, I still felt very like small and other and little here because especially in the 90s, Downey was very white, very rich. I mean, that's just, that was my perception. That's what I saw very institutionally white. And so I didn't have that, and there was no ethnic studies program. Um, I think all of our teachers were white growing up, right? Like, um, or most of them. And so it just felt like it wasn't talked about. So it was now looking back, I'm like, oh, of course I didn't explore my identity. Of course I wasn't asking questions to my grandmother about her story. I mean, of course, stories that she told, but it was just sort of like, okay, whatever. Like, I'm trying to be something. other thing. I'm not trying to get made fun of for bringing this food to school or for bringing, you making salsa for potlucks or whatever, you know. Um, and where was I going with this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, oh, this informs my writing because as many of us experience that first like ethnic studies type class that we usually take in college is when all of this comes together and it's like, oh, actually I do have an important cultural identity that is not, that wasn't even looked at, you know, growing up here. So I think the, the makeup of Downey is completely different now. Uh, and so I wonder how young people are growing up feeling like their stories matter or that they even under, that, that even gets discussed or addressed in school. Because at the time, at least growing up in the 90s, early 2000s, that wasn't, um, it just wasn't talked about. It wasn't even addressed. It wasn't even acknowledged. And so it, my writing is informed by growing up in this area because I only understood myself and my identities and my cultural identities really I had a chance to dive into them once I got into college and I came back here as an adult when I was 25 and was like in love with the suburban life of Downey after living <laughs> in places like San Francisco. Like, wow, this is so nice to just have quiet and to just have um, peace uh, or space, space. Um, but now reflecting on like, what are the ways that growing up here made me actually feel like, kind of turned me into a very shy person um, because before moving here, I would correct people on my name all the time. My name is Marisa, and I know it looks like Marissa because you don't hear it, you know, but I would correct people as a little kid, like, I don't understand, you hear me saying Marisa, like, what is going on, you know? Um, but then when I came here, all my teachers called me Marissa. If I meet anyone that knows me from until I was, you know, seven to 18, they call me Marissa. I know that it's because they met me here. Uh, so I was able to, like, claim myself only when I moved out of here when I was 18, mm -hmm. and then could come back. So. That's kind of what I was thinking about. And this book is a lot. I wrote all of these poems like in my parents' backyard in Downey because um, I was afforded the space, the quiet, the time to do that. Um, but it also, these are all stories that I could gather, even understand once I left to kind of see myself outside of this white majority that kind of I was erased in. Thank you, Mike. Hi, Marisa. Um, the street level practices that I do as an urban planner have a direct connection. Directly do they trace back to sixth grade at the Montebello Library. And I'm going to tell you why. It can be an isolating experience growing up in East Los and Montebello as a half white, half Mexican kid who doesn't speak Spanish and has green eyes and looks more gringo. Um, you can be boxed out. But one of the things that I did with this experience, um, moving from East Los to Montebello when my mom got a house, is uh, especially not having many friends, I found my way to the library where this wonderful um, repository of knowledge was available, all for free. 
And the first book I remember checking out was a book on graffiti. It was a book on New York subway art. And I eventually went on to buy a copy of that book or got my mom to buy a copy because I just could not put that book down. I was also a creative kid, so I would draw and paint. My mom's a painter too, so I got it from her. But as I started to get older, I started to do, to do graffiti, first in sketchbooks and then on the street. And then I started to meet older graffiti writers and make friends, and I got really good at it. And I eventually graduated to doing murals at like 15 years old. This is at, this, we're talking the late 80s, early 90s, where I had to learn how to navigate space. I had to learn how to move through police jurisdictions, because when you're a tagger, you need to know, do I have to run from LAPD, sheriff, Downey police, or somebody else? Also, am I crossing through gang territories? Where are the vigilantes, right? You gotta, you gotta learn how to navigate space. In doing this, I also developed a very strong appreciation of the built environment, architecture, of design, and of public space. So, those were some of the seeds that trace back to the earliest days of having my feet on the ground. When you're doing graffiti and creating murals and doing artwork on the street level, you're not in a gallery, it's not in a sketchbook, it's not in a studio. It's usually somebody else's wall, but it's in the public space. So in reflecting on this in the last couple of years, especially as I've started to develop embedded planning, I realized from the earliest days, I started creating art and culture on the ground, like embedded in the community. And from there, it just kind of blossomed. It's a long story, but it blossomed into what I'm doing now, which is pushing urban planning to the street level. Mike? Yeah, thank you, John. Um, Southeast LA was very, Southeast LA County was very influential in uh, me becoming a writer simply because my grandfather lived in Long Beach, but he had grown up, uh, he was born in LA in 1918, and he grew up in South Central. My dad had grown up in Inglewood, and my parents, uh, my dad's side stayed in Inglewood. My grandmother died in Inglewood. Uh, last white lady left on her street, never left. Um, my mom's side, they bought a house in Long Beach because they got a house three times as big for half the price. They, they did white flight in the early 60s. Um, but my grandfather had all these stories about LA and he, for a brief while he was a jazz drummer. And, and so he was a guy that had friends with everybody. His mom was Mexican, his dad was English, but his father was an interpreter on the Union Pacific Railroad. And so, my grandfather taught me like wherever you go, you're friends with everybody. You're, you're, there's no person that you're not friends with. And so he knew the lady's names at the grocery store. He knew the guy's name at the bookstore. He knew the, the butcher's name at the, you know. So everywhere we went, he's oh, this is my grandson. And so we would roll everywhere. And uh, he told me 10 million stories about SoCal. And so then all of a sudden, I'm 18, I'm going to UCLA, it's right after Rodney King. And I'm starting to read all these things. And all of a sudden, all these stories that my grandfather had told me started to mean something. But also my buddies and I used to ride our bikes up and down the San Gabriel River. Um, my first girlfriend was in Downey, actually went to Warren High School. And we used to, I met at, we met at the Cerritos Mall. <laughs> and we used to go to the Lakewood Mall and the Cerritos Mall and we were riding our bikes from, we ride our bikes anywhere from Cerritos to Long Beach to Downey to Norwalk to, I used to buy baseball cards in Hawaiian, Hawaiian Gardens. And we were just anywhere and everywhere on our bikes. and. Um, in 1990, Cerritos was declared the most ethnically diverse city in the nation. I mean, now it's it's even just mostly Asian. But um, Cerritos was a great place to grow up just because our street was was super mixed. And we all played, uh, you know, Ditchum and we played hide and go seek and we played baseball in the streets and we played football in the streets and we hung out. Um, and so the, the zeitgeist of the early 90s and everything that was happening in LA at the time, I think, uh, my childhood in this part of SoCal. Um, I lived my entire life in LA County. From 18 to 30, I, I moved every year. I was in Koreatown, Hollywood, Westwood, West LA, Culver City. I'm now in Monterey Park because it's where my wife grew up. But um, being up in Southeast LA County really kind of prepped me for every which, every which everything you could expect. So um, I always have deep love for this area. Thank you. Um, well, that's a great segue um, into the next part of this is so I don't want to ask like a pedantic question like what makes Southeast LA so special, but I'm trying to get at in that question I'm trying to get at like what is unique about Southeast LA because it informs your work and Jonathan informs your work. You know, like is there something special about this area of the world? Um, and can you guys talk about that? What's that? What is that? Can you capture that? either from built environment or from the population or how those things merge together. 
Yeah, I could, I could start us off. So for me, the, the border between Southeast LA and South Central LA is very porous. Sometimes, I think it's generally considered Alameda, Alameda, right? It's generally considered Alameda. And if you're on this side of Alameda, you're in Sila, and if you're on the other side of South Central. But at that nexus point, there's a community that I've been working in for the last 16 years that is a little bit part of both. And that's what I'd like to talk about right now. Yeah. The community of Florence Firestone. Has anyone heard of Florence Firestone? Let's see, a couple of hands going up. It's the same zip code as Watts. It shares the same zip code. It has the same streets that run through it. It's just that it's an unincorporated area. And unincorporated means it's governed by the county. Because of that, it's, it's kind of obscure. All of the unincorporated areas throughout LA County are obscure. But this one gets kind of submerged into Watts and in, into, into um, all the neighboring cities and other parts. And it, it, it does have its actual own identity mm -hmm. and its own history. And we actually have a community member representing Florence Firestone today. Martha is here. Martha, Martha came through. <laughs> We're currently developing a nonprofit together in Florence Firestone called the Florence Firestone Community Organization. So more to come on that. But the, the origins of my work really trace to embedded planning in, in, in Florence Firestone. And again, I think it represents both SELA and South Central because it is on that nexus. This is a community that has been misunderstood for decades upon decades. Not only is it unincorporated, but it's part of South Central, part of SELA, and people usually just know about it for the social ills. Crime, gang violence, drugs. Um, our, our colleagues from before the previous panel, um, the report from the LA Times, Doreni talked about it, how the LA Times itself has been part of reductive and demeaning coverage. So as a planner on the ground, I got to see the exact opposite. I got to see all the beauty of this neighborhood. Working there uh, since I started with LA County back in 2006 and continue my work today. There's so much vibrancy, there's so much, there's so much history there and there's so much unity between all the different communities. Now, can you be a little more specific about that? Like yeah. what is it about the place that gives it that richness that you're talking about? Drive down Florence Avenue on the Florence Firestone stretch. Mm -hmm. I know Florence cuts through Downey, but continue going west, go to the Florence Mile, and you'll see it has a stimulus there. It has so much activity. Mm -hmm. Pedestrians, um, uh, beautiful old architecture. You have a very diverse community, black and brown folks coming together. You have a lot of preservation there that's just kind of, luckily, um, informal. And it hasn't gotten a lot of historic preservation uh, official efforts yet, but you have this this wonderful coming together and vibrancy there. Mm -hmm. And as a planner, this was a community that allowed me to come in and really form bonds of, of, of mutual trust, mm -hmm. right? And develop this idea in a community that needed planning help, not planning imposition, right? So, so these kind of misunderstood and hidden stories are part of Southeast LA. Mm -hmm. and, the, and if you get if planners, especially the ones out there watching on, on video and on the future archive. If you get out from your desk, sure. you'll actually see all of this vibrancy. You cannot understand a neighborhood from Google Street View. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be able to see it, smell it, hear it, taste it, touch it, feel it, and experience in that kind of proximate relationship. So Sela and Florence Firestone are all part of this, mm -hmm. this innovation and planning. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jonathan, you were talking about this idea that these are stories that are hidden and that Southeast LA is kind of under the radar sometimes. I was, so I've never worked, this is my first city job, right? I, I've been in museums most of my career and TV or something like that. And, um, and I took the job down here. I first started as the, as the president, I'm the president of the Space Center down the street. I was first foray into that and then I got this um, on top of it. But, um, this idea, I was told when I first started here that um, Southeast LA does what it does because it doesn't get covered by the LA Times. It doesn't get covered by the media at all. So it's easy to either get away with things or to not be seen. Um, and both of those are kind of connected. Um, so is, is that a little bit of an answer that I'm trying to get at? Or Mauricio, um, what's your take on that? Oh. 
I think the only thing I'm thinking about is kind of, yeah, going back to what Dorney said, what you were talking about too, Jonathan, and there's like landmark in East LA, Boyle Heights, there's Chicano history in some of those neighborhoods. And there's that here too, but it, yeah, it doesn't get covered. It's not even in timelines of history necessarily. So why that is, I think that's something for you know, sure, us sure. to be telling those stories and, yeah. and to be putting that out there. Um, but that's an interest, and now I'm thinking about that, like people just living their lives and it's not, you know, sometimes those words like untold histories, and I, I use those words sometimes too because what's the better word? It's like the word is that it's not looked at, like unlooked at histories. Un, like people are just not looking here. They're not coming here to do stories or then those stories aren't promoted as big. You know, like Eric calling the New York Times, really? I was like, what? <laughs> like he just called the New York Times to get that article made um, that Downey, the uh, Mexican Beverly Hills, um, it's like, well, okay, is that what it's going to take? Like, but why was, why, why did that person listen to him? You know, if we're not being sought after for these stories, where can we go? And like, who's going to listen if we take these stories? My follow-up then is why, why is it important to tell these stories? Like, what's the, I mean, is it just that it's untapped, it's an untapped reservoir or why, why blow the cover of Southeast LA? So there's a lot of great things that have come out of Southeast LA. Um, for example, even Cerritos, some of the greatest hip hop DJs in the world came out of Cerritos. The Bee Junkies, Rhett Matic uh, is my homeboy. And not just Rhett Matic, but there's um, J-Rock, there's this guy named Melo D, David Martinez. These guys are some of the, they were amazing DJs and they used to play these house parties. They, they're all a couple years older than me. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the one that I'm mainly friends with is Rhett Matic from the Beat the Visionaries and the Beat Junkies. But these guys used to be in the Cerritos small and they were the dudes a couple years older than you and they used to play the backyard parties. But I mean, the Carpenters came out of down here. Sure. I mean, they came here when they were a little bit older, but um, there's a lot of amazing things that have come out of this area. But people used to say something like, you know, to be, a, to be a prose writer in LA is amazing because everybody's a screenwriter. And so it's kind of like, you have all these neighborhoods that are famous, San Fernando Valley, um, you know, as Mercer said, Boyle Heights, everybody's, you know, the, um, and even South Central and, and South Bay, the punk scene of the mm -hmm. South Bay, but there's just as many things that have come out of this area, um, but it isn't as glamorous. It's and, and what's interesting about Downey too, North Downey has got some of the biggest houses in SoCal. There's some amazing giant houses in North Downey. Um, but then, you know, these areas are, like Lakewood was the Aviation Okies. Yep. And I mean, Beach Boys came out of Hawthorne, but there's a lot of these neighborhoods where a lot of heavy people came out of, and members of uh, Metallica were in, were in Norwalk and Downey. And Morrissey stopped by the Middle Order Records. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of things that have happened around here that do, for, you know, because there's so many famous things in LA. And my, sure. buddy, my buddy always says, that, you know, LA loves a good funeral. <laughs> they, don't, they don't love somebody to tell them dead, you know, and, and, and he's, he's pretty right about that. Sure. You know, somebody got to die before you get some love, you know, um, and so these, there's a lot of things that happen in places like Downey and Cerritos and Norwalk and Whittier and oh, Huntington Park and Southgate and Linwood and all of these areas. Um, and so, but maybe the fact that it is so below the radar, it does get to... Um, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to pick up on your question. Yeah. Why is it important to tell your own stories? If you don't tell your own stories, other people will tell them for you. Mm -hmm. And those could be outside interests. Mm -hmm. Those could be people in power that want to see your community erased. Mm -hmm. It could be the creation of new narratives that lead to gentrification and displacement. So one of the things you can do, for example, is write your own community history book. That's what we did in Florence Firestone. We wrote our own community history book because literally no historian or author had ever written a book about Florence Firestone. We can certainly talk about that today and I wanna get a copy into the Downey Library. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but like, this is what you have to do. Yeah. Write your own stories so that your stories are told and you don't have your stories told by outside interests that don't have the community's best interest in mind. That, that's, that's fantastic. Um, you know, what you were talking, both of you guys, what you were talking about, uh, we're talking about really hits home for me because, um, uh, you know, a couple things. One, I was a surf fan for a long time, and the first surf hit was Pipeline, recorded right down the street at Downey Records, 1961, by the Champagnes. Like, huge, huge thing, and surf music had amazing influence throughout even the punk era. 
um, right here. And I didn't know that until I started working here. And I, and I was like, wait a minute, I've heard, I've heard Downey before. I, I was 45 of that, it's amazing. Um, didn't put it together. And then also at the Space Center, I, we're located on the old North American Space Rockwell. shuttle was built in Downey. The Apollo capsules that went to the moon were built in Downey and the space shuttles were built in Downey. The first rocket engines, all of the rocket engines that took astronauts American astronauts out in space until the SpaceX launch a couple of years ago were all directly related to our site. It's amazing stuff. Tell these people, I was just at a museum conference last week. And I tell people about what we do. They're like, wait, what? Where was that? What are you talking about? So I agree. If we don't tell the stories and if we're not good stewards, like we're stewards of the story, right? If we're not good stewards of that story, somebody else will come in. You go to the Smithsonian, they never mention anything that happened. Although all of their collection is from right now. Um, so along those lines, um, and kind of thinking about storytelling, right? Um, I'm wondering, like, do you feel, do you feel an obligation? Do you feel like a, um, do you feel pressure to get this right ever? Um, let me say that again. Well, I want to go back to your your last question sure, yeah. before because, and, and actually the aerospace. So when we were in fourth grade, we had to make these like puffy paint T-shirts, <laughs> like a grid of all the important things of Downey. Ah. Aerospace being one of them, which is exciting, which is a prideful moment. Like, well, yeah, that happened here. Sure. To know that, to grow up with it, that was cool. Orange trees, because of there's the history of orange, the orange or orchards here in Downey. Uh, what else? McDonald's. What is it? The oldest McDonald's is here. Right? Yeah. Like, okay, so those things are about a place, but it has nothing to do with me, right? It has nothing to do with my cultural history, so I could not see myself in that. And so what's important about telling these stories, I think it, it's about definition, and it's about broadening definitions of activism or defini definitions of what matters, definitions of history, because history and activism doesn't need to be um, what makes it into, a, what usually makes it into books. Activism and history is raising your kids, um, <laughs> help, you know, accessing health care <coughs> and navigating systems of oppression and what that does to a body, a life, a generation, a family. And so to me that's, there's not one version of any ethnicity or racial you know, history. So it's like, why, if these stories are told here, then that just broadens definitions and helps people and that all leads to belonging. So. That was kind of my, my tie into those things. I absolutely, totally love that answer. You guys are doing great too, but Marcia, um, because that that is the project of well, the space center in some ways, but also the library in other ways. Um, we we know that the history at the space center that we talk about does not necessarily relate to what Downey is today or mm -hmm. Southeast Downey. Mm -hmm. It's a history from 22 years ago at the very last least, right? Mm -hmm. um, and our job is to try to figure out how to lift up what's here now, mm -hmm. but also let people know that that's their story too. Yeah. It's just how do we weave those two things together? Um, and I know this is not, this is something that's not just unique to us. This is happening all over the place, right? Um, so I've often thought about it as Southeast LA is the is what the US is gonna look like in 10 years. So whatever we're doing now is trailblazing and becomes the model for the entire country. So on that note, um, talking about responsibility, um, how, how do you think that we can bring these, not just the stories, but the practice, the embedded practice, the um, uh, just the energy that you've already described in this panel out more? Like, how can we get it out more? How can we be that model for the rest of the United States? <laughs> and if this is a not a good question, you can no, totally no, tell me to so like, you know what? Uh, I've been I've been looking through a lot lately. Um, you know, there's I would there's two amazing women that I would say have been doing this work for 40, 50 years. Uh, Judy Baca, the muralist, mm -hmm. and Dolores Hayden, mm -hmm. uh, who is an urban planner who's now retired. But uh, both Judy Baca and Dolores Hayden uh, really advocate this idea called sharing authority, where when Judy Baca painted the Great Wall of Los Angeles, which was the longest mural in the world. She had 300 young people painting with her. But not only did she have 300 young people painting with her, she paid them, she got grants to pay them, yeah. but they also did community feedback where they decided what to paint. They did a 10,000 year history of California. They started with the La Brea Tar Pits. Mm -hmm. 
and they started with the whole history of the Native Americans, but they were doing this in the 70s. Everybody now, um, and 1980 Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States came out, but the whole idea of history from the bottom, history from the real people, not the conquer history, not the John Wayne, mm -hmm. not the cowboys and Indians, the old white guy on the horse, but the people's story. The, the woman who's lived in the neighborhood for 50 years, she's the one who's the real historian, mm -hmm. not the PhD guy at USC. You know, the PhD guy at USC knows some good books and he could pass a couple to you. You know, no disrespect. But, sure. but that, that sharing authority idea, and uh, Judy Baca was talking about that in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Dolores Hayden wrote a book called Power of Place in 1995 that totally re uh, reshaped the paradigm of public history around America. Mm -hmm. And people using public art as a way of telling the people's stories, but an artist from the neighborhood. So Judy Bach had a program called Neighborhood uh, Neighborhood Pride where they got a muralist from the neighborhood. They painted over 150 murals around LA over a 20 year period. It actually was, uh, was it ended up getting canceled because Noni Alavizi, a woman who, who just recently died, painted a mural of the Black Panthers and really upset a bunch of conservative people in the early 2000s. And murals were illegal in LA for 13 years. Really? Garcetti actually, uh, yeah, the, mural, did that. the yeah. mural ordinance was lifted in 2013. Wow. But uh, if to, what we're talking about here, just look to what Judy Baca, Judy Baca wrote an essay called Whose Monument Where, Whose Story Do We Tell? She wrote this essay in 94. You read it, it could have been written yesterday. Wow. She was talking about taking down monuments. She was talking about what are we really celebrating and whose monument, met, you know, whose monument where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I say as far as your question is concerned, there's people that have been doing the work for a long time and um, follow their lead. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. On that yeah. note, yeah. Uh, just from the planning sphere, in, in the same way that Mike talks about sharing authority, and of course, Tracing back to Dolores Hayden, it makes sense that that I would want to offer a bottom-up planning is the way to go, and like actually bottom-up planning, not in any type of check this box, like let's just do it for appearances, but you really have to reinvent your planning practices so that they're bottom-up. That's how we can show leadership in Southeast LA and beyond. So what does that entail? It means being truly collaborative, working as a collective, and something that I teach in my classes at Cal Poly Pomona Urban and Regional Planning is that we should always think in terms of we, not I. Mm -hmm. The planners should always be thinking in terms of us, not just me, just we, not I, mm -hmm. us, not me. It's a really collective mindset. With that, you've got to put your feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. So if any work is happening from the city, you got to get out of City Hall. Mm -hmm. um, in part, I drew from embedded librarianship to create embedded planning. I drew sure. from embedded journalism to create embedded planning where the librarians go out to the community. Yep. The journalists get embedded in, in certain spaces, right? Mm -hmm. And I drew from other things, but that type of embeddedness, it exists anywhere. That's what we have to do. Totally agree. That is, if anything, about both of the spaces that I get to be a part of, um, it's getting out of the four walls. It's taking, these are just hubs for us. They're not where we spend all of our time. We, I have teams throughout Southeast LA taking science, taking books, taking whatever. And we're trying to bust that up even more. Um, Marisa, do you have any other thoughts on that or a follow-up question too? Well, as a former educator and now diversity, equity, inclusion consultant, I am just very similar to, the, to how you approach your work is just, okay, who do you need to ask to make things work better for the people who they're supposed to work for? And you know, my mind's already going. I'm like, okay, let's work together. Yeah. Let's <laughs> do it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, Come well, on. let's talk to teachers. Let's talk to students. Yeah, no. Like, who who's doing the educating? Sure. You know, what are the examples that they're being shown? And that's just, it just, again, it goes back to belonging. Um, um, your question was like how to get it out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Getting out there. And I think the first thing is to listen. You know, no matter who you are, is to listen and to come from that place of, and know like that's an important, that's a priority. Like for all of us, and I don't think it's to me. I don't see it as pressure or obligation. To me, I see it as like my. This is something that I have to do. This is something that I need to embed in, in every, any kind of work that I do. Like, okay, who can I bring along with me? Because I've been brought along, you know, to be in these spaces, to even be published. Like, I didn't know how to do this. It was through groups like Women Who Submit or Friends, like Iversis, who told me this is how you do it hey sign up for this thing do this i saw other writers that looked like me and that had similar stories i'm like oh yeah so um right because growing up here i thought yeah writing and even in college throughout college i was like oh writers are just 
old white men who, uh, who was it? Yeah, who drink alone. Who go on a and say, like, poor in there, you know, in their apartment, lonely, drinking a lot. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so how, what, let's like, you know, how do we do this is, again, yeah, listening and, and changing that stereotype, changing that narrative um, and getting more stories out. I want to take a quick detour because you mentioned your your consulting work. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, you're here as an author and a and a resident of Southeast LA, but this is fascinating. Sure. Yeah. Well, Beatrice Garcia is here. She's my co-founder of Virtue That Work. So we created this business, DEI consultant business, to do the work that we didn't have support to do, which is when you're doing when you're trying to um, make things better on any level, especially through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you get a lot of pushback, there's a lot of resistance that can happen um, through the forms of many different guises, whether it's not money, or like we can't do that, or whatever the reason might be. Um, and so now we've just created what we wished we had, which is infrastructure and support to um, help any kind of business, um, whether it's nonprofit, for profit, whatever the space is, just like how to do your DEI work better, so that the people that work there and the people that um, you are, you know, offering services, support, uh, product to, actually don't feel excluded from either the work or the services or the product. That's great. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. That's amazing question. Um, you know, Mike, I want to because I want to be able to leave some time open for discussion and for questions and stuff like that in it because. It, you guys have some fans over there? Um, <laughs> this is a whole group that came in together and I feel like they have a lot to ask, which is great. Um, so Mike, I want to lead off then with sort of a final, a little bit of a wrap up question, but we can do it. I'm, I run this place, we can do whatever we want. Um, uh, I, I want to get at, you know, we have, a, we have a panel here with an urban planner and author and business owner and artists. Where do you see the intersection of all of that stuff? Like, if you could describe what we have here and, and how that either personally affects your own work or, or whatever, what would you, how would you respond to that? The intersection is, is that we are all stewards. Uh, but us and I met doing poetry workshops together. We did poetry workshops together. We did three, four summers together at 826 LA. Oh, yeah. and you know, we always had a good time and we both loved students and we did some poetry events together. We published her at Cal State LA. And, and so there's all of these, these, you know, and Jonathan and I have done a number of collaborations. I, I think it's about, is it, as a steward, it, it, you know, first of all, it's about the love of the work, but there, it's also about friendship. It's about community. It's about collaboration. And it's about connecting different people. And you know, um, each of us here have been lucky enough to mentor a bunch of young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked what Adorni said earlier about having a mentor because I had some mentors and I've been able to now mentor a lot of young people. But uh, passing, passing it on, passing it on. And my biggest inspiration for that was the great pianist Horace Tapscott, who's the founder of the Pan-African People's Orchestra. And for 40 years, uh, they had three generations of musicians. But uh, the Pan-African People's Orchestra was, was just about was about passing on the music and using the music. And uh, Horace Tapscott used to say that art is contributed, not competitive. And so I know we live in this very competitive world and everything, but it doesn't have to be cutthroat. You can give, you can you can help somebody younger than you get published. You can, uh, if some if I meet somebody who says, you know, I'm trying to get more about diversity, equity, inclusion, I said, you need to meet Marissa. And then boom, send her email, you know? And so right. like, three, four times a week, I'm trying to connect people on different things. Mm -hmm. Somebody tells me they need somebody, oh, I know somebody over here, I know this, I know that, and you know, and sometimes you're the one getting connected, but a lot of the times I'm connecting people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, so a part of it, the work is, is to share the love, to share the community, and the intersection is, is that we can wear a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all focused on community building. Mm -hmm. Building thing. community yeah. and, and knowledge, you know, and, and uplifting one another and, and, and learning. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know something, admit it and listen. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? I second all that. We, we, are, we are all fundamentally trying to make the world a better place, right? Through our different ways, our different practices. And we're not doing this from a position of I, we're doing it from a position of we. We're, we're building community together. So I'm really happy to be here sharing this space with everybody. Uh, on the panel, but also everyone in the room, because I know 
that we're going to have connections to follow up on from here. Mm -hmm. Right? We're going to we're going to keep talking about um, the work that they do, the work that I do, and it, it starts with us coming together. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, my sharing your story about your grandfather and saying that you know becoming friends with everyone you meet—that's Mike everywhere he goes. He's friends with everyone, <laughs> but it's on a really, and it's not just a friend like saying what you just said about connecting. You're a connector. You're a community connector, and even like an uplifter. Like you help me feel very like validated in what I do and, you know, like really, um... You were fun to teach. We, we, she was great. And, and she loved the students, and, and, you know, thank you. It was, fun to, it was fun to teach with you. And like an elevated, you bring in, uh, like a very elevated level of passion to your work, and so then that helped me to, like, match each other, you know, like, oh, I can bring that same level of my passion to the work, too. And just thinking, so the, the word storytelling is what, like, storytellers, like, right. that's you telling your stories through your poetry, of your family, of your students, of learning the stories of the community to make the cities better, um, my family stories, uh, my students' stories, uh, and so that's, to me, that's what connects us is storytelling, mm -hmm. and that's just sharing humanity and, yes. and not being isolated in, because even Southeast LA is very big in and of itself, mm -hmm. and so across the city, how can we share understanding of each other through this kind of storytelling. That's excellent. You know, um, actually you're making, because of you, I have actually more follow-up questions, sorry. We have more time. Um, <laughs> so the inspiration for today, uh, so we started the Beyond Book Fest last year, small first year trying it out, see if it was gonna work, we got it successful. So now we're even bigger this year. And this year we actually kind of had a theme, it's in the background, but it's there. Um, and it's based on a Tom Wolfe essay from 1964. Uh, about the Sonic subcultures in Southern California, but they focus on down, right? And all those different cultures. And I'm fascinated by this. Um, and and how and it was interesting in that. So this panel kind of is the culmination of that, and I'll tell you why. Because those subcultures in Southern California in the early to mid-60s were so tied to what was going on in aerospace at the time. Hot rods are hot rods because guys were taking pieces of rocket material back home on the weekend, souping up their cars. Um, surfboards are surfboards because of the foam and all the materials that were coming out again on the weekends in people's trunks to customize them, goof around with them and stuff like that. Um, also, so many people were moving down here, they were having so many kids that those kids started doing garage bands and surf music and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so I find it fascinating, this intersection between culture, storytelling, and the built space. Um, if I were to ask you guys to think about what Southeast LA looks like in 40 years, what, and I'm talking visual now, what would, what would you see? Did anybody hear about the new train line they're gonna build mm -hmm. down the Pacific Electric right away? That's gonna be going through Downey, it's gonna be going through, um, Artesia, Cerritos, Bellflower, uh, Downey, Paramount, and um, I mean, I think it'll look a lot like it looks now, but it's going to get souped up. Okay. Like the hot rod. <laughs> yeah. My vision is that the folks who live here now will be here in 40 years. The folks who have built Southeast LA will not be gentrified out because they'll have organized, they'll have worked with planners who work on the ground. Um, not planners who are stuck behind a desk staring at zoning ordinances that don't have a real direct connection to your humanity, but instead they'll be working in coalitions to understand how these processes work and when necessary to fight back. So um, they'll have the capacity to defend against gentrification and displacement, and it'll be that much more vibrant and diverse, and people will still be here. It's really important that in 40, 50 years that we don't have a complete uplifting and up uprooting and erasure because that fundamentally damages our communities. Sure. Larissa? Yeah, and I'm thinking exactly what you said, still be here, but I was thinking on the level of uh, some of the themes that came up in these poems are around the, the environmental racism happening in Southeast LA, not Downey necessarily, but people that moved here after Downey, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I'm sure that we're affected here too, so just people still being here because there's not as much cancer, because there's not as much death from what's happening with that's gonna, that lead that's gonna be in the ground for right. many lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm. So clean up, clean up yeah. and health, access to healthcare and money, like 
you know, just something to give the people that are affected by that um, and generations of that what they need to drive. We're not done yet, though. We are going to take some questions from the audience. We've got somebody ready to go right now. What's your name, by the way? Frank Martinez. Frank. I grew up here since 1974. And uh, the diversity, I'm going to be, I'm just really proud of Gabby. Uh, growing up, went to East Middle School, Japanese American kid, uh, introduced me to, to the Japanese American community, so I don't want. So I kind of was into martial arts. And that's why I became a big leader. Chinese American, I'm a Calvin Chung. We went to high school. Three of us, we were the oddballs. So, but it was beautiful. But the diversity, uh, we go to see Star Wars every weekend. And that's not a title, that's a, you know, he's <laughs> So our diversity of food was great. And Volti. Yeah. Volti Aircraft. Mm -hmm. Now he served with Duke Kahuna Moku. Right. Duke he used to surf all the time. He's in Huntington Beach. I went, I went surfing this morning at the pier. That's, that's my local spot. Awesome. In Hawaii, we have it. So the diversity of Gali, Duke of Hudamook and Volte, the engineer, this is in 1920, they made the first paddleboard. And in Southgate, that's where the first balsa board surfboard. And I, I make, I, my hobby is making balsa surfboard. And uh, it best kept scenery. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so um, yeah, this is pretty <laughs> Any comments? I just want to say these are the kind of stories that we need to tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these also are the kind of stories that need to filter into community plans yeah. and vision plans and specific plans, all the technical documents that we create. Yeah, we, high school. we can bring some more uh, humanity into it. 1983, I went with James Hartfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, was, I was in the punk rock, and I, I ran the moment. Because punk rock wasn't what it is today. It was music, Black Flag was, I want to be a white American. If you listen to the music, he was a Puerto Rican kid, wanted to be a white, you know. But then, you know, it got tragic. Oh, yeah. But the, the, the first generation of Black Flag, yeah. that's what it really meant. And Reyes, I think they were Reyes. And growing up here, I'm a skateboarder. I'm a surfer, and I go to Michigan. On the other side, I've surfed the lakes. Yes. Oh, <laughs> freshwater boards, man. Oh, yeah. And it's freezing. It's freezing here. Yeah. Lake Michigan. I, I worked in Mishawaka, Indiana. Oh, no way. And uh, I remember when my friend got married, we went to the Catholic Church in Notre Dame. Oh, who is the Latinos here? <laughs> 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 but, but it, we're Catholic, damn it. <laughs> I grew up here in Alpha Chapel. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jonathan, could you be a little bit more specific in this idea that, um, in Celebrate, like how, what does that look like as an urban planner to bring these stories out? How, how do you engineer that in a, in a space? Well, this, we have to remember that, that Frank's story is shared by many, right? Like this, these, are, these are also community stories. So we can, we can take these life experiences and these really unique memories of place mm -hmm. and of, 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 of value of culture mm -hmm. and instead of just of course we, we share these values and we, we talk about them in our private spaces but we can we can endeavor to bring these into the direction that we want to go mm -hmm. in in our in our next 20 30 40 50 years and one of the mechanisms to do that is to create long-range plans that's where urban planners come in okay. if they're if they're nothing more than dry policy language mm -hmm. that is spoken in plannerese, you know, like that, that bureaucratic um, planner speak that's really hard to, to, to penetrate. It's very, very meaningless to the actual community members. But if you can start to bring in people's lived experiences to inform your policy mm -hmm. and also to actually make it sound like a document that is readable, right. your, your plans will be engaged, your plans will be better, and your plans will better reflect people's actual lived experiences. The way you do that is you get out of your desk and listen. you put your feet on the ground. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know what, uh, Frank's story, um, Sonia Romero just did a thing called El Sereno Serapi, and they, they, they created a 200 foot long wall with tile mosaics, but she got stories from about 50, 60 families in El Sereno. There's an area where, um, you know, you guys probably know this, but um, more people get hit by cars in LA than almost anywhere in the world. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of streets in LA that do not have sidewalks. Mm -hmm. There is an area um, where Mission Road becomes Alhambra Avenue where there was a woman that was killed a few years ago. 
And, and so they're, they're now using public art, and this is gonna come back to Frank, by the way, but they're, they, they, Sonia Romero created this wall that has these tile mosaics, and she asked a whole bunch of people, story share, so the li some libraries hold story shares, mm -hmm. but Sonia asked a whole bunch of people to send them her story, and she met with them, and she got all their stories about growing up in El Sonia. Some of it was like somebody that, they're, they've got their prom photo from 50 years ago, and she made these little tiles. Mm -hmm. And so like if you were doing something like that in Downey, you'd get Frank's story, and you, maybe you'd have a, a part of public art that would, would commemorate it. Um, but they did a thing at the LA Public Library in the 90s with story shares, and people would, sometimes they record it as old history, sometimes they'd say, hey Frank, can you bring in some photos? They've even done, they've published books, but, um, Public art to me is one of the easiest ways to do it. Uh, the policy stuff is awesome, but policy stuff takes 10 years to pass. <laughs> right. You know? uh, also, besides public art, public library, public museum down the street, that, those are good, good platforms. Uh, yes, please. Oh, my goodness. You guys have given me such a, um, so many ideas. I mean, I've, I've heard so many cool things that, you know, I, I'm a, high school teacher, and uh, we just happened to see a video uh, yesterday morning. Uh, we have breakfast in the classroom, and uh, there was this video that was actually from uh, NBC News, and it has to do with uh, a kid, I believe he was from Haiti, being here in the States. Lunchtime was the most terrible time for him. It was crucial, you know, he didn't know what to do during lunchtime, he didn't know anyone, he was new. And he started talking to people, and then he started a movement, a club hmm. in high school, where he they go and talk to every student who's by themselves, and let's dine together. Yeah. Okay, so that listening aspect that you were talking about, yeah. you know, that comes into play. That, you know, uh, situation with cars just, you know, racing in the streets and stuff, you know, that, that's basically, you know, people not listening to one another, not caring for one another. And I, you know, I come, I'm coming out now to various, uh, not to a lot of places, but because of the pandemic, I've been staying home. Oh, sure. You know, so I think that's another thing here, there, an element that we all share worldwide, mm -hmm. not just here, but what's happened because of the pandemic and how people kept, you know, to themselves and now all of a sudden, Everybody's out there, and, and you know, uh, I live out in the valley, and a lot of people from the valley do not come out yeah. here. Okay, they really have a, a a bad, you know, it has a bad reputation. Of, you know, it's like we're valley people. We're here. We don't go there. Well, it's you know, it's dangerous. Away. You know, so <laughs> there's this very disconnected, and also, you know, I mean, our city is so vast area. So, I mean, how can you really have everybody, you know, which is possible, definitely. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, I think, I, you know, TikTok, you know, uh, they said that 10 San Francisco's fit into silence. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it, it's, it, it, we're talking about, uh, you know, just a, you know, a monster of a city yeah. where, you know, it's possible that we all connect. And, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, the pandemic has really brought out this in, in a situation where, People are not more at ease now, but you know there's still so much that needs to be done that people are kind of like saying, "Hey, we need to start, you know, touching base with one another and communicating." If I can just, sorry, I'm not a panelist, but I'm going to jump in on that. On one of the things you said about this monster of a city, I think for me as a museum director, as a library director, that makes it important for us to go to where people are. Yes. It's not, we can't expect people to come to the museum, we can't expect people to always come here. One of the frustrations about being a museum professional in LA, and I've worked at all of the big institutions in town, is that they would spend tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to increase their small footprint of LA. And the model is still they bring everybody there, which is ridiculous. There's people in the valley, people on the, in Venice, all over the place that can't get to that one place. So it's really important for us to decentralize um, as much as we want to bring everybody together, because we are a decentralized space for a lot, but I think it's important for us who have this, um, who have this responsibility or this power or whatever it is to decentralize our experience and get out to where people are. 
Yeah, well, you know, it can start happening in schools. Sure. Where if teachers are, you know, having that vision, mm -hmm. that kind of vision, mm -hmm. it, it, it's going to grow into, you know, people being able to get together. It doesn't yeah. matter where you are. Yeah. Not just. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it gets lots of C other parts of the city. Um, <laughs> any, any other questions? Wow, it's silent over there. I'm surprised. Sorry, I prejudged on my stuff. Yes, yes, please. Um, I have a question for all three. Um, I feel like what you guys have something like very specific. So my question is, where do you find local stuff storytellers? Like I live in Whittier, and I, I, I'm very familiar with Downey, and and but I I just. It's it's really refreshing to hear professionals or just people in general really centered around the community. So where like where do you begin within your own or how, like is our our storytellers like hiding in corners of libraries or you know I, I guess if you guys can advise or you know I, I, right off the bat well I I did grow up in the spoken word poetry scene and and I started doing poetry from the time I was about 18 19 years old. And a bunch of us were latchkey kids that had all like um, come out of divorced families. And so like our poetry thing, we were going to punk rock shows, we were going to hip hop shows, we were going to art galleries. And so for me, like the little underground art scene was where we created the family that we wish we had. Right. And um, so for me, it was these little communities and these little little house parties. And, and the, the, there's, a very, there's a very vibrant poetry scene. And I would say, I was gonna say, is there a place that you can access that though? Is there like a website that somebody could go to or? I mean, even that state gallery up the street on Downey Avenue has some pretty good poetry events. And, and you know what, there was a couple of great poetry events in Whittier. And there's a dude named Eric Morago who lives in Whittier and he has a publishing company called Moontide Press. And I did a couple of poetry events at Whittier College and their, their mascot is the poets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Grace, no. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, Something that I would take into the classroom when I would work with high schools is that I would always walk in and say, every one of you is a writer, which I really do believe like is a personal philosophy, whether you've ever written a story down on a page, but we all have stories and thoughts and emotions in our hearts and our minds, but maybe nobody has said, tell me your story, so you know, write it down, because we might feel like we don't know how to, or we're not good at it, or we somebody told us we weren't good at it, or whatever. Um, so I wonder, like Frank just told his story, like Frank's a storyteller, right? What about the surfboard I was in Howard, we were surfing with Gidget, the real Gidget. And guess where the first surfboards were made? Phil surfboards in Downey. Nice. And she gave me the shirt. And she told me about two more You know, yeah. we were in it. Sure. <laughs> but, you know, so I wonder, maybe the Gidget, this is Gidget, story. the real Gidget. Yeah. yeah. The real Big deal. <laughs> so I wonder to you know like who do you already know who's in your life that you don't even know because they don't see themselves as a writer or a storyteller yet and somebody that I was going to share earlier um, one of the questions was about um, like who are important writers of Los Angeles or writing about Los Angeles and somebody that I wanted to bring up is uh, my mom worked with a social worker when she was at County Hospital and she didn't know she was a poet at the time. It turns out she's our neighbor now, and so they reconnected. And if she, her name is Zaira Ramos, and if she got published, she would be just as in our canon as Sandra Cisneros. Like, she is just such an amazing poet. But I didn't know that, my mom didn't know that. It wasn't until then some other poets down the street, they started uh, like a salon of, of poets just in the neighborhood. They're all like in their probably 60s and up. Um, and they're creating that space for themselves and one of them actually started a press. Like, so we're up here because we've been published. We can call ourselves writers for whatever reasons or whatever age we started calling ourselves writers. But I think if that's part of your like uh, desire to connect to people in that way, I wonder if part of it is also you helping people see that they're storytellers and writers to like bring that into your life too. And, and for me, Embedded Planning taught me that every community member is a storyteller. Every doorstep that I went to, every door knock, every time I canvas, every time I popped up, every time I walked the block, I learned so much more about the community. Because what I didn't do was bark at people and finger wag, <laughs> like, you know, like the, the typical bureaucrat. I would start by saying, hello, what up, right? Like actually create a human connection. Um, it's surprising that in urban planning that fundamentally deals with your future and your life, like you have a lot of people barking at you when you ask about a permit, right? Like, I have to undo a lot of that, and my fellow embedded planners are doing a, uh, undoing a lot of that. So 
you know, I, I remember going to the gas station on the corner of Alameda and Nadu, and I had to talk to the owner about some wonky zoning violation issues. And I, we got through it, and then I asked him, so how long have you been in the neighborhood? And he proceeded to tell me this wonderfully rich story that ended up in our book. Oh. <laughs> he ended up being part of a chapter in our book, and it was because I asked. Right. I asked him, tell me your story. We're done, we're done with all the zoning stuff. Tell me about you. And he, he told me things that I would have never known and would have never made it in our book about Florence Firestone had I not asked. Mm -hmm. And until somebody's asked, they might not feel that their story is right. important right. or that exactly. they are important exactly. enough to tell their story. Exactly. There, hold on, hold on. There, I'm very so good to you in a second. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Isaac. I uh, just had a quick question for the panel. Uh, in your experience, um, how would you uh, advise the community to be more proactive and maintain like la cultura or you know uh, be more proactive in, in doing you know something similar to what you guys are doing? I know it's hard sometimes because uh, I, I always tell people like the poetry scene is great when you're in the middle of looking for a job or you just had a breakup or something. You know, I mean, I, I've seen I've seen I've seen a ton of people that would come out and write and participate. But then down the line, um, the year my son was born, I laid a little low, you know what I mean? And, and now I kind of go to balance where I'm putting my family first, but I'm still out doing a lot of these events, but it takes a lot of time. And, and so like, uh, you know, a lot of people will, will, I've seen a lot of people come and go. A lot of people come out and they'll, they'll come to some art shows, they'll come to some poetry events, but it takes a lot of commitment. And, um, and so, and I know it's also not for everybody. Like uh, my wife is a painter, but she hates poetry. <laughs> and it's cool. It, it's totally, it's totally fine. She comes about one, once or twice a year to something I do. <laughs> no, I, I don't hate painting. <laughs> um, I think for the people in power, the people that have power to make decisions, it's about embedding. I'm gonna now be using a lot of that language. Yes. Yes, about embedding, preser preserving culture or history or stories into whatever decisions they can make. Um, and then for the people who don't have a lot of power in decision making, it's maybe about not creating new things on their own, um, but trying to seek out those places that already exist or people that are interested in creating together to see what can happen with community. Like starting in community to create and preserve community. because. Um, it's just more fun that way. It's you can create more, um, and it's not isolated. It is fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from the urban planning perspective, in terms of advising the community on how to be more proactive, there's two parts. Number one is getting involved in the formal process of planning. So, for example, when you're out walking your um, your dog out in the community, and you see one of those notice of public hearings taped <laughs> to the utility pole, I'm asking you to actually stop and read it. Also, figure out what are the community plans going on in your neighborhoods and try to participate if you can. Um, because fundamentally what's happening is that decisions are being made about your lives because urban planning affects every aspect of our lives. So definitely get involved in the formal processes, but go beyond that. I know this takes more time, but there's value in it. Organize, remember, we not I, start to build networks, build coalitions, learn about this thing that's called planning Learn the planner's secret knowledge. I will help you, reach out. I will tell you all the things that you need to know that oftentimes are buried behind Public Records Act requests and other obscure ways of finding information. Organize, get together, and then you can even do more because you'll be now on a much more equal playing field with the secret knowledge of planners now in your grasp. And you'll be able to, um, you'll be that much more empowered to push back and take back control of the direction of your neighborhood. A lot of decisions are being made about our communities, and this is not ever said in public, but people in power, they're okay when nobody shows up to the community meeting, mm -hmm. or when the public hearing has zero attendance. Yeah. So learn how to fight back. They're gonna pass that policy anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we can fight back when we organize to have a wall of opposition, let's say if it's a gentrifying project, right? Like, I've seen it happen. We can fight back, and it starts with understanding how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, thank you. Andres, 
Well, I think Vanessa just sort of kind of said what I think, I, what I was planning to say, but what I was going to say in sort of in response to the question that was asked about like living in Whittier, not knowing what, you know, where to find these communities of writers, artists, I think you're all doing it here. Right. This is it. We're communing. We're all writers. We're all artists. We're all creators in some way, um, to some degree or another. And so it's coming to things like this. This is we're doing it. And it's also, if you don't see it in your community, it's about trying to organize this. Yes. And it's not easy, and it may take a while to grow. If there may be two people show up, that's fine. You'll love those two people. Two people is the start of a movement. Yeah. Uh, I just, Andres, thank you for being my staff member. Um, <laughs> just, that's a great way to kind of wrap this up. Um, I want to. I have a philosophy that I've told these guys over the past couple of years about how to think about places like this and in our role as staff, right? And how to think about places like the museum is like, we're like wedding planners. The, the, the main event is not us. It's not the library, it's not the library staff, it's not what we want, it's not the museum or anything like that. The main event is the couple, it's the whoever it is. Um, we are here though as a resource to put all of those pieces together so that you have the greatest day of all time or the greatest community of the network. So use places like this. Use this room. It's free. You can come in here. Um, let's organize a regular thing, right? Um, if you feel like you want to get access to people that you can't find in Whittier, let's talk and figure out how we can get them to this place, or how I can talk to the Whittier Library to make it happen in your area. Like it doesn't have to. We have no ownership over this stuff. Um, so yeah, just you know, wedding planner philosophy of management. That's, that's my one contribution to the world. Um, I want to say thank you so much to our panel. Um, I, we've been very, 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 very.